Many thanks, Warren. Um, thanks the EPA again for the invitation. What a hard job to be here right after lunch, and I hope you are still awake and with me. I realize some of my um, some of the insights I'd like to share with you today are were already mentioned this morning, which I actually I think is a great thing. It feels like um, knowledge on behavior change is being more and more disseminated. Nevertheless, I hope the way I packaged it and I selected what to share with you today. Um, is helpful in bringing that forward in our work and is also um, hopefully a good reminder, if you already know this, that it, this is still um, not mainstream and not implemented in, in most of the sustainability projects or circular economy projects, so that I hope um, this helps you take your work forward in also engaging citizens and consumers with the circular economy. So um, for today, I have, let me see if I manage, two promises for you. First promise is I hope I managed to um, help you achieving or gaining a more realistic view on people, a more human view on people, and hopefully this more human view on people also helps you increase in the impact of your projects so that um, we try to overcome some of the assumptions we have when we talk about people and we really try to understand what really moves them and how can we engage them with the circularity. And my second promise is to start, not maybe equipping is a very strong word, but start equipping you with um, a practical way of thinking, with some um, practical concepts of how can we advance circular behaviors in practice. Um, so very quickly, first about the CSCP, the organization I work with, I work for. So we are about 60 people in Germany, but we are an international team. So perhaps half of us are Germans, the, the other half are from Brazil, like myself, from Colombia, from Italy, from China, from Costa Rica, and we come together with different uh, backgrounds to then try to advance sustainable consumption and production, and indeed, sustainable lifestyles is the team I'm part of. Um, and we work towards a good life with different projects from um, European or Asian or African product projects, but also more German and even more regional ones. Perhaps you're familiarized with some of those. Some, some are funded by the European Commission, so Horizon projects. Some are funded by um, foundations. Some are connected to the European Commission, like we are part of the stakeholder platform for the circular economy, driving this circular behavior topic. Um, just to give you examples of the type of work you're doing, perhaps you're also yourself involved in some of those. With a range of partners from local to international ones. So I think a key question for us to start with is why behavior change is so important for circular economy. Um, and I, I guess this is, um, well, this might sound now common sense that we need to engage consumers, that behavior change is important, but perhaps five or seven years ago that was still a big uh, question mark or change or, or um, fight that we needed to, to, to to get across and, and change for that. And then more recently, I think an IPCC report helped us um, getting, I think, even more clarity. So it's not us working on it, saying it. It's also science and scenarios showing this, that I think beyond technological advancements, business models, really engaging people, changing the demand side of the story has a huge potential between, of between 40 and 70% um, um, of the changes needed to get us to our to 2050 um, carbon targets. And then connecting this specifically with the circular economy, um, well, the, the, the European Environment Agency who we work with, and I think more and more actors in this area, have more and more put emphasis on behavior change as a key lever for achieving circularity because there is rarely a goal within the circular economy that doesn't involve a person there being involved, perhaps buying something. I'm not sure why it's keep skipping, but I, I come back. Um, there is a person there involved in buying a product or uh, using a service, um, of needing to sort their waste, of needing to engage their community, helping a neighbor. So rarely a situation where there is not a human element involved. So it's, it's, I would say it's uh, unavoidable that we engage people in a proper way. And still, um, for example, taking repairing as an example, um, that's still not the norm. No? So um, to help us, then uh, to reminding ourselves that, that we have a, a huge, um, challenge ahead of us, for example, that um, perhaps a third, well, that's what research shows, no? a third of people that have bought, a, 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 a third of Europeans say they, 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 they repaired a product in the last six months, people that then in general looked for, for new products in the market. And reasons for um, not repairing are most often beyond technical issues. So. Um, 
even um, products that are fully uh, functional are, are still replaced and more often than you can imagine. So what are the issues behind those behaviors that we need to address? So understanding behavior is, is very important for the influences behind our behaviors. And to start with, um, before we get into some um, advice on understanding people or, or at least some insights, um, let's first try to look into ourselves. I think it helps us um, getting a better understanding of um, actual behavior. So I put um, here on the screen four, uh, four different behaviors. So first, if you pay for a member, uh, gym membership but you don't go to the gym. Um, if you eat a lot of sugary snacks, perhaps more than what you'd like to. If you hit the snooze on your alarm in the morning, even though it's the time that you set yourself to wake up, or if you text and drive, or if you text and, and ride a bike, um, do you connect to any of those behaviors? Or perhaps letter E, you are a super rational person. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I connect definitely with this news one. I did it this morning, for example. Um, I have done it with the gym as well. But uh, I think the whole idea is if you connected with at least one of the first four behaviors, congratulations, you are a human being. This, um, what research has shown about our behaviors is that um, most of the time we are not acting rationally, although we would like to think otherwise. No? So most of the time, and this irrationality is not a criticism on people, so we shouldn't feel uh, upset about this. It's just if we understand um, better how people tick, we have a better chance or um, we are better equipped to find solutions that are more realistic and more effective. Um, and then addressing behavior starts by having na, a realistic view on how people actually behave. Are they recycling or not recycling? Are they repairing or not be repairing? If they are, what is the reason behind it? And if they're not also, na, what are the maybe actually the complexity of influences is usually um, more than one na, in place that are influencing people to decide not to repair and go straight to the shop to buy a new product. And despite knowing this, that we are most often not acting rationally, that we are most often being driven by emotions, by our habits, by our lack of time, we still design, I would dare to say, most of our solutions, circular solutions in our case today, as if people were entirely irrational, as if people were still um, balancing all pros and cons to, to act. Um, so, as part of our work in the European Topics Centre, together with the EEA, um, the European Topics Centre on Circular Economy and Resource Use, we did a report last year that was interesting, and part of it talked about misconceptions um, that we have with regards to people's behaviour. Because if we want to engage people, we first, I, I, if we already start by, um, I think, avoiding mistakes in this engagement, I think we are already a step ahead, and then we can see then what else we could do. But then I, I thought it would be useful for us to, to realize those misconceptions and, and see if I connect to that or if you connect to that in your work. And then I would share some insights on a, on a, on a thinking approach, practical one for us to address uh, behavior change. Um, but the first one is that rationality guides most of our decision-making process. It's still um, the case that we think people are rational all the time. And that's a misconception because we often assume that wrong. Ne? It's not true. Most of the time people are still driven by other factors, as I said, like um, emotions or our habits or the context. Ne? So a lot of our behaviors are influenced by, by our, our situations. Um, and an example of that, and actually this was also mentioned this morning, is that um, often it's cheaper or it's um, financially more advantageous, advantageous <laughs> to um, repair instead of buying a new product. And still, in most cases, people don't even consider that as an option. And actually, with this report, we found out or there, were ev there was evidence that, um, that that's also an, a false assumption that, that repairing is um, most of the time more expensive. There was research showing it really depends on the sector, it really depends on the type of repairing service you go for. If you actually engage people in self-repair, which is even a cheaper option, I know that's not possible for all types of products, but I think that's also for us a wake-up call to, to, to address or uh, challenge those assumptions in our projects and try to really find out in practice what are the barriers that people face. Um, so first, net people are not always um, rational. Most of the time, they're not. Secondly, that by changing behaviors, we, by changing values, we change behaviors. Um, that's, again, unfortunately, um, a mistake or a misconception we bring in our projects. Uh, because changing values doesn't mean people really change their uh, behaviors. What do I mean by changing values? People, for example, appreciating the environment or even appreciating our projects or thinking that repairing or circular economy is important doesn't mean that they introduce that in their own lives. And it doesn't mean that they are lying. It's just that sometimes life comes in our way and it's 
could be challenging. Right? It's not the most convenient option. Um, so often people, um, well, and then there are other things for us to consider. And first, that changing values can be hard. Sometimes they are often stable, very stable. Um, secondly, we would be surprised to see that um, a lot of people already bring um, maybe more pro-environmental values, attitudes, also for the circular economy. So maybe they already have those values inside of them. And that values in the end don't help us really getting the action to happen. We are often not consistent with our intentions. And then finally, focusing primarily on what people say. I know that makes probably research easier now, a lot of because it's difficult, for example, to observe consumers in a large group for a long time, engaging in depth interviews in order to get insights. I know that that's a challenge, but we should be aware that. Um, relying only on online surveys with thousands of people and, and moving our strategies on only what people say um, also brings its own shortcomings. So we should be aware of what people say is less, is less important than what they really do. So let's try to, as much as possible, understand how people actually behave in, in reality. So what does this mean for us? So if we get better insights about people, we have better chances to develop smarter projects, projects that I think um, bring more um, impactful results. So we like to think of projects with these three pillars of insight, so understanding people better in their context, what really hinder or motivate them to separate their waste now, or to bring a, a product to a repair shop. Is it different from product to product, to neighborhood from neighborhood? No? Um, and then I'm up using um, behavior change models and tools to um, organize that intelligence, or actually to bring intelligence to that knowledge that we collect, and test and learn interventions on the ground. And current behavioral models have been super helpful in helping us um, planning our projects. Usually they are smaller, they are pilot projects, but if they are well conducted and tested, we can get insights to then scale, for example, to the national level or even European level. And um, some of so. There are many models out there, but they usually bring three important questions to us when thinking of maybe policy interventions or solutions. And then I brought these three aspects for us to, to, to as, 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 as this practical thinking, to think of solutions. So first, do people want to do this circular thing you want them to do? In other words, is, um, is there a motivation in people to engage with your project? And perhaps people are motivated, they want to do it, but they don't really know how to do it. So they still sort things wrong. Um, so is there ability or capability for people to engage with that thing you want them to do? And then finally, is there a reason for us to act now? Is it urgent enough? Is it um, there in our face, maybe very convenient or very supported by other people? So is there a social norm? Is there infrastructure? Is there time, money? All the things related to the world out there that create the opportunity. Um, so I would really suggest um, when thinking of solutions that you bring those three questions to the table, to your team, even do uh, brainstorming together to reflect about those because what at least uh, science say and we feel more and more reassured of that when we go to the ground is that those three elements are crucial to make a behavior um, happen in practice. And then very quickly before I close, I brought three insights th from three different projects of ours uh, reflecting those questions. So we did, um, we, we did a project called the Consumer Insight Action Panel, where we had stakeholders from all over Europe in different stakeholder groups in what we called clubs, and we had an electronics club. So producers, startups, CSOs, all working in, um, in this topic of electronics. And we identified the behavior which is, was returning or giving back smartphones. Um, and then we did a small test in the website of, of Refurbed, which is a, was an organization that, that actually is a marketplace for reused um, electronic products. And the idea is that to, they wanted to start buying back those smartphones. And what we found out is that a banner inviting people to sell back their phones, highlighting um, the money advantage um, as opposed to environmental advantage of returning the phones gets more clicks, um, even among people that, have already, uh, that are already more environmentally conscious. It doesn't mean that every time the, the economic benefit is um, useful. We also, I think we heard today an example already um, showing that that was not the case. But in this case, it was, and we tested it. So if we were to put a campaign out there for this, we probably don't want to highlight any economic or environmental benefit of returning the phones. We want to highlight the economic benefit of it because people just click more. No? Um, when talking about repairing and mending clothes, um, we found out in the same report with the ETC, with the EEA, 
that there is a lack of skill, um, for example, to know how to repair clothing, and that's a barrier for people to do that themselves. And that's a type of product that requires less, I think, expensive equipment that could be easier, easierly um, or more easily um, taught no? and learned. And then finally about, is there a reason for us to act now? And um, what our partners from Behavior Change um, in England found out is that using social norms to motivate people to order their bins for organic waste and increasing their organic waste recycling rate uh, was an effective way to get people to start recycling their organic waste as well. So thinking of social norms as a, an opportunity, as, as a social pressure for people to recycle more their organic waste. And they used that in, as part of their campaign, saying that more and more people in that specific neighborhood were recycling their food waste. Okay, I think I'm way beyond my time. Um, I hope I brought some new idea to you and I'm happy for our discussion soon. Thanks.